today. Thanks for taking our time to join in, and I'm sure it's going to be, you know, it's going to be impactful. And um, this project um, is sponsored by the Aberdeen City Council. Um, it's a community project, and um, it's just to see how we could help people, you know, overcome this pandemic called diabetes. As you will agree with me, it's a pandemic on its own, you know. So, um, so who am I? Um, I'm also known as Faith in the community here, and I've been in Tory. I've lived in Tory since 2010, so coming to 11 years now, and I love this community so much. And if there's one thing I want to do is to impact lives around me. All right, and I'll also want to see this community thrive, which is the goal, the brain behind coming up with this project. When I realize this is a struggle, and me being also in that line, you know, having been experienced it, I thought helping out, helping others out would be a great idea, not just in the community, but to impact lives all over the world. So that's my drive. And I'm we're casting from Jesus House Story, which is a community church here, and we support um, um, community projects like, like this to see how we can reach out to, to others. I'm a mother of three lovely children and um, 13 year old, a 13 year old, a nine year old, and the last one is six. <laughs> He's no longer a baby. And also um, a wife to a blessed husband. Now my journey in and out of diabetes, I was first diagnosed diabetic in 2007 while I was pregnant and it was called gestational diabetes. And I was told, okay, after that, after having a baby, things are gonna settle down and all that. So I took it in good faith. And after that, I was told to, well, I had to be on insulin most part of the pregnancy. And I had to go off insulin after the pregnancy, but it was a little bit better than what it was during the pregnancy. You know, and I was hoping that would be it, but you no, know, I was kept on tablets. And I've been on medications since then, you know. It's been up and down, it's been as high, my HbA1c, you know, which is like the the, the um, three months review we go for, you know, the numbers have gone up to over 50, you know, and it's not been, it's not been easy going on, being on medication, trying to tackle this thing, because I don't want to be on medication for the rest of my life. Anyway, I don't think anyone would like to do that. But um, thank God for helping me, you know, to come out of it, for showing me a few secrets of which you're going to hear in the course of this training, you know, here and there is going to come in. And I'm sure um, soon you're going to find your way out of this pandemic called diabetes. Trust me, trust God, there's an end to it. And it depends on how we take it. Okay. Right. So in this event, I'm not alone. I've got a wonderful medical practitioner here, Dr. Adeze. And she's a GP and a lifestyle physician. She's been a blessing to me. And actually, that was my stepping stone, my first step on my journey out of <coughs> diabetes. So please, can we say welcome to Dr. Adeze? Just to say welcome to her. She's going to come back again to share her heart with us. But for now, can we? Can I see thumbs up for her? Can I see? Waves for her. Can I hear hellos? Yes. So she's here and she's here to help us. So I'm not alone. I'm not alone. So um, I'll just, I know we, we didn't start sharp. So I'll just um, say, please, can we get ready notepads or, you know, questions you may have in your mind, you know, and you need to like type it in into the chat box at some point. Either you send your questions directly to me or directly to Dr. Adeze herself. And I'm sure um, before the end of today's event, we'll be able to answer most of those questions. So I'll give, please, can I ask that we all mute ourselves just for sound? All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Doc, that's, that's fine, okay. Right, so over to the next session. I believe we're all ready to run now. All right, to run. So I'll quickly invite Dr. Deze Fezulike, a GP in the UK and a lifestyle medicine physician. Over to you, Doc, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fezulike. 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 Thank
you very much. Thank you, Daibara. I am so you know pleased that you were able to set this up. Um, not only have you been able to get on top of your diabetes, but you now want to go out and help others. I, I think that's amazing. I really commend you for getting this program going. Um, it's amazing. Thank you so much for inviting me. I know it says host there in the names of participants, but I'm, I'm, she's the one hosting. <laughs> so we want to really appreciate you. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I hope that works. Let's see. Um, right, let's see. Can you see my screen, everyone? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Let me make it full screen. Right. Okay. So uh, you're in the right program if you're here because of the Tory on Mask Services Project. Then, yes, you're in the right place. Um, my name is Dr. Adeze Fezulike. I'm a GP here in Aberdeen. I trained here actually many years ago and, and just kept on staying and living here. So I've been in Aberdeen for maybe about 16, 17 years, something like that. And apart from being a GP, I've, I've got a special training in lifestyle medicine, which is a field of medicine that encourages people to use their lifestyle to manage their chronic health problems, okay? So for many years, uh, as doctors, we've always treated people with medication, tablets. We give people tablets and more tablets and more tablets. But um, we are finding out that a lot of these conditions are not getting better. And people are then tied down to medication for years. They have to be on tablets. We start with one, then we add a second one, then a third one, and we keep going. So. They, this, you know, the body of medicine decided that there has to be other ways, and that's how lifestyle medicine came about, to encourage people not just to depend on the tablets, but to look at their lifestyles also, to see if there are any ways they can use their lifestyles to improve their condition. So one of the conditions we, we're really looking at is diabetes, and I uh, will show us some figures. There was um, a global report 2016 about diabetes. There's something in the chat. I don't know if that, okay, right. Okay, fine. Just a moment. I'm going to remove. There are lots of things popping up. The control, right. So that's gone. So in 2016, there was a report on diabetes, and it was quite shocking. And it says that um, the number of people living with diabetes has quadrupled since 1980. Quadrupled, four times the number. And that uh, equates to about one in 11 adults. So out of 11 adults, one has diabetes. And many people don't even know they have it, which is shocking, you know? And um, so we, on this call today, I don't know how many we are, but if you divide that by 11, that will be sort of the number of people that have diabetes in our midst, in just this small meeting. And worldwide, we now have over 400 million people living with diabetes. So it's quite and we need to look at where that is. So if you're not familiar with diabetes, the full name is diabetes mellitus. That's the full name. And diabetes, the word diabetes comes from uh, too much urine. So it's a, it, it, the word means too much urine. The people that have this tend to pee a lot because they have all this sugar in their system and where sugar goes, water goes, you know, so they're peeing out their sugar and a lot of water goes with it. So these people keep on peeing a lot. That's one of the symptoms. And that's where the name diabetes came from. Now, uh, the mellitus there means from honey, because one of the things the doctors then, you know, in the past noticed that was that the urine of these people with diabetes tasted sweet. <laughs> and in fact, that's how it was diagnosed in the past. The doctor will actually taste the urine and say, oh, so sweet, you've got diabetes. That's how it was diagnosed. Uh, but thankfully, we now have blood tests for it. We, we don't have to taste anyone's urine, which is good. <laughs> you know, so when we do the blood test, which can be by pin prick, so a wee needle uh, prick on your finger or an actual blood sample taken from your veins, we send that to the lab. So we're looking for the level of the blood sugar or what we call the HbA1c. If you're diabetic here, I'm sure you're familiar with HbA1c. It just gives you a picture of how much blood sugar you have over a period of three months. So it, 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 it gives us more information than just one pimpri, you know, just the blood sugar. 
you know. So that, that's where the word diabetes mellitus came from. And it's important to realize that there are two types of diabetes. Can I check that my screen is changing? What can you see just now, Daibara? I'm muted. I can see the types of diabetes. Right, okay, good. So it is moving, that's good. I've done a presentation before and this didn't move at all. So <laughs> I've learned to check that it is moving because you could be changing it on this side but it's not reflecting on the people watching. Okay, so we're on types of diabetes. Mm -hmm. So there are two types. There's the type one, which used to be called the juvenile diabetes. It was thought to be, you know, common in young people, okay? But there's the type two, which is what this program is about. And that's common in adults. It's also called adult onset diabetes. However, what we are finding is that a lot of young people are also beginning to have this adult type. So even though it's called adult onset, a lot of young people now, now have that. So I just want to differentiate between the two types because it's really important to understand the difference. The type one is more in younger people. The type two is in older people. In type one, it's sort of sudden, you know, suddenly this child is unwell, they are peeing all the time, they're really unwell, you know, but in the type two, it's a gradual thing, you know, it sort of creeps up on you, and the type two is a commoner form of diabetes. When we say diabetes, we often mean type two, because 95% of diabetics are type two, okay, they are often overweight in type two. Whereas in type one, they're thin. These individuals are really skinny, you know? And in the type one, it's an autoimmune disease. That means that their own system, their own bodies, their own immune system is destroying the cells that produce insulin. Insulin is such an important hormone. We'll talk about that later. But the, if you don't have insulin, you can't really, um, you can't put on fat, you know, you can't add weight, you can't, manage your, your eating, but your body is not able to store any food. So these individuals are really skinny due to lack of insulin, okay? But in the type two, um, it's more due to weight gain. It's related to weight gain, okay? Now the type one is progressive. The type two is reversible, which is what we're trying to explain to people because in the past we just assumed, oh, I've got diabetes, that is it for life. But from Daibara's story, you can hear how she, she reversed her own diabetes. She's no longer diabetic, actually. Her HbA1c has been in the normal range for, for a while. So that's fantastic. In the type one, dietary treatment doesn't work. You know, so it's, we don't use diet to treat type one. But in type two, you can change your diet and that can help. So I hope that gives us a good idea of, you know, the difference between type one and type two. And to emphasize that today's program is about type two diabetes. Okay, you may not feel the diabetes. You can have it for a long time. And that's why we say it's a gradual thing, okay? People have it for ages, they may not realize it. And it's often picked up by a blood test for other things. I remember I had a patient who came because she's been having thrush. Thrush is candida infection which is quite common, you know, people have it in their armpits or in between their legs or under the, if, if ladies that have got really heavy breasts can have a thrush infection under the breast, just anywhere where the skin meets together, anywhere that is moist, people can have thrush there. So this lady was getting treated for thrush and she came again and said, oh, I've got thrush again. Can I have medicine? So I said, you're getting a lot of this. Are you, have you been checked for diabetes? And she hadn't been checked. So I said, let's do a pinprick. So we just did a pinprick there in the clinic and she was, her blood sugar was way through the roof. So she, she was actually diabetic, but hadn't been picked up. The thrush was just a sign. Thrush, this bug called Candida loves sugary places. So it was giving her a sign without getting all this thrush, mm -hmm. but it took a while to, to actually be checked for diabetes, you know, which is what was needed to be treated than the thrush. So, you may not feel the diabetes, but it is causing damage. Diabetes is the commonest reason for amputation. When people's limbs have to be cut away, it's often due to diabetic damage. Kidney failure is another one. Heart attacks, blindness, strokes, even some cancers have been implicated with this. So it, it is uh, quite a, a condition that is causing a lot of problems. So 
that disease is not new, okay? It's actually an ancient disease. As far back in 1550 BC, it was mentioned in an old document, a medical document called the Herbas Papyrus. They mentioned about diabetes, so it's not new. But the, what we're asking now is how did an ancient disease become a modern epidemic? How come in the past, um, the, the statistics says in, from 1980, the rates have quadrupled? Why, why has that happened? And that's why we're laying this foundation so we can all you know, see what's been happening. So uh, in, in 1977, the government introduced what we call the food pyramid, okay? Now, I, I think most of you will recognize a food pyramid. Maybe you've, you've seen one before, you know. And in the food pyramid, if you look down lower bits, the, the, the base of the pyramid, you see things like bread, cereal, rice, pasta, and so on. And we're told that we should be taking these foods between six to 11 servings every day. That was what the food pyramid said. And these are the very foods we know that make people add weight. But the government said, you take these foods, body for you, you know. Prior to that, <laughs> maybe the moms will say to their children, oh, you mustn't take too much sweets, you know. Oh, you've had your breakfast, that's it till lunch. You know, your parents told you what to eat, sort of. But I think the government felt, well, we better step in and make everybody do the same thing. And then you now found that following this, that things like bread became the main food. Before then, people didn't, bread and toast wasn't the main, wasn't breakfast really. But with the advent of the food pyramids, lots of people began to eat bread, rice, pasta in, you know, huge amounts. It became the staple food. What we found with that is obesity increased. So people started adding weight, and with this, diabetes increased. Okay? It's just right, a para, you know, they, they just went together. As people got bigger, diabetes increased. So the emphasis since 1977 on encouraging us to consume diet high in carbohydrates and low in fat has taken its toll. It has really, um, and it wasn't intentional. I think the government had good intentions, but unfortunately what we found is that that made things worse. Now, but the good news is that if this issue of diabetes is caused by your lifestyle and diet, then your lifestyle and diet can reverse it. That's actually the good news. So it's not bad news. It's good news in the sense that, okay, if people start eating more of the bread and rice and pasta and all that, added weight and diabetes came. Okay, could we reverse that? Could they eat less and less and less of that to help with their diabetes? So the good news is that it's not your genes, okay? You don't have diabetes because it's in your genes. It's not bad luck. It's not some witches or wizards anywhere inflicting that on you, okay? We do know now that it's a lifestyle condition which can be reversed with one's lifestyle. And I'm hoping over the next four weeks, so we're doing this for four weeks, we'll be back again next week, Saturday, same time. We'll do that four sessions, okay? Teaching on this. At the end of that, you'll be so equipped. You'll feel so much in charge. And for once, you'll begin to feel right. I think I can get on top of this condition. That's exactly what happened to Daibara, and it can happen to anyone here. I don't know if, if you're diabetic, just drop, drop in the chat. Are you on medication? I'm interested to know how many tablets are you on? Are you on one tablet, two or three tablets? Uh, so feel free to drop a message in the chat. I would like to know sort of the people who logged in, what attracted you? What, what made you come? Do you, is it because you're diabetic yourself? or you know someone who is, you know, or you're a doctor or a nurse or treating people, I'd be interested to know uh, the sort of profile of people who have come into this program. Okay, so it's interesting to know that using your lifestyle is not a new treatment. As far back as 1797, a Scottish military surgeon, this man, John Rollo, he suggested that if you take an all meat diet, the, the sugar in the urine will go away. You know, it was speculation. He, it was an observation he made that, wow, okay, if, if someone eats all meat, cause or every other thing, it, it's all meat, their, sugar, their, their urine wasn't sweet anymore, you know, because they didn't have all this research and they didn't know much, but this was an observation he made. 
And in his own time, he was saying, okay, you better drop every other thing you're eating. It's only meat. You know, we're not recommending that, but I'm trying to tell you that over the years, there's been that looking, looking at diet, what are people eating, discussing these diabetes. So that was one of the things that they, were, they looked at. In 1883, Okay, just follow the history. It's really interesting. This French pharmacist, uh, Apollonier Bochadat, forgive me if you're French and I've murdered the name, <laughs> but this guy, he noted that during periods of starvation, during the war, diabetes improved. You know, it was an observation made. He was looking after these diabetics. And of course, the war came, people didn't have much to eat. And wow, their diabetes got better. So what, what changed? Was it the starvation? Is it because they didn't have enough food? Were they eating less? Is that why the diabetes improved? So that all that began to make people think, wow, okay, this could possibly be, uh, you know, related to diet. Nothing. And then in, in the 20th century, and these two Americans, uh, Frederick Allen and Elliot Jocelyn, they noted that during periods of fasting, diabetes improved. You know, so again, people were looking at these things and beginning to join the dots. Oh, okay. Now, if, look back. If people are eating all meat, all meat is protein. They are not eating carbohydrates. Their, their blood sugar is improving. Then this person says, oh, during the war, there was hardly any diabetes. Now, these two people are saying when people fast, their diabetes improve. So there must be something in that. Okay. So while all that was going on, something amazing happened. The medicine called insulin was discovered. Insulin was discovered in 1921. And it was fantastic because in the type ones, remember the type one diabetics, they don't have insulin and these people were dying. You know, the, the lifespan was about seven. They died when they were 17 years or 18 years something because they had no insulin and there was no insulin. There was nothing to give them, nothing to treat them. But then insulin was discovered and wow, it was great. All these type 1 diabetics got insulin, they got better, they started adding weight, they started eating better, they started living long. So it was fantastic discovery. However, what happened was then the dietary treatment for diabetes began to be neglected. People began to look away from looking at what they were eating to looking for medicines, for medication. So medication became the norm for both types of diabetes, not, not just type 1. We know that medication cannot reverse a dietary disease. No matter how many medicines we give you, if the problem is with the diet, the diabetes will not get better. Instead, what we're going to have to do is to keep adding medicines. A lot, if you're diabetic here, you know you started with one tablet, and with time we added a second one and a third one, and some even go on to insulin. You know, it just progresses that way because this is a dietary problem. It's not something medication should be solving, okay? So, the, but because they were throwing the wrong solution to, the, to this problem and it wasn't getting better, that's how the notion came about that diabetes is chronic and irreversible. That's why, why they concluded on that, because they were treating it wrongly and people were not getting better. Okay, so insulin, great for type 1 diabetics, not so great for type 2 diabetics. Because, because follow this really important. I want you to understand this is we're laying foundation so that next, next three lessons will really be impactful for you. Insulin makes you gain weight. It worsens your diabetes, you see. People who are overweight, people who are obese already have too much insulin in their system. So they don't need more insulin. They don't need medications that increase insulin, you know, because they already have too much. That's why we say they have insulin resistance. They have so much insulin that their body is actually resisting the work of the insulin. So when you give these people more insulin, they're not going to get better. They're not going to get better. And that's what we see. Okay. So there's the usual advice go to don't smoke. And I hope if you're here, you're diabetic. I, I really urge you not to smoke. If you smoke already, seek for help. Try and stop. It's really important. Monitor your blood sugar, you know. These are, uh, these are the usual advice we give. Do your feet check. Very important to check your feet. You remember we said diabetes is the greatest cause of amputation when people's limbs have to be amputated. It's often due to diabetes. So you need to check your feet, make sure there's no wounds or cuts or anything because they, 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 when you have these things, they are difficult to heal. 
They don't seem to heal up in diabetics and get worse till they are needing amputated. Do your eye check. Diabetes causes blindness. So you must see your optician yearly at least, you know. Keep your blood pressure under control. So these are all the advice we give. And I hope every diabetic here is already doing that. Very important. So the question is, if you're doing all that, why then do we still have an epidemic of diabetes? It's because what you eat and when you eat is the key. That is the key to coming, you know, reversing this condition. Is the diet. The dietary angle has been neglected. And I'm hoping this program will help us to get back to basis. Because we've always known, right from, you saw how we went through the history. It was always known what the problem was. Okay, so the key to reversing type 2 diabetes is when you eat, when you eat it, it's a dietary problem. If you don't get anything else from today's meeting, please get this. If they ask you, oh, were you on the diabetes program? What did you learn? Just tell them that diabetes is a dietary problem. So if you lose weight, you get better. Very important point. Once you have that in your head, your journey to overcoming your condition starts. In type 1 diabetes, have no insulin. Therefore, insulin works wonders for them. But in type 2 diabetes, they have too much insulin. Therefore, treatment must aim to lower insulin. Whatever treatment you're using, for it to work, it's got to lower insulin because you already have too much. Okay? Let's look at this analogy. It's like looking at children in a crowded class classroom. So all these children are in the classroom <laughs> and they're coughing. Everyone is coughing, 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 coughing. So my question to us is, what's the solution? If all these children are coughing, what do we do? How do we treat them? Should we give them some cough medicine, maybe? <laughs> you know, should we give them some cough syrup so that all of them will stop coughing? Or are we going to look at the root cause? Why are they all coughing? What is the underlying problem? What's making them all cough? That's what we should be looking at. You know, we should be looking at the fact that maybe the classroom is overcrowded. But if we focus on the cough, if we're like, oh, this child is coughing. Here is a cough mixture. Take some medicine. Oh, this one is coughing. Oh, so we arm them all. All the children, as they're coming into the class, we give them a bottle of cough syrup going with your cough syrup, you know, you're arming them with cough syrup. But then we're neglecting the fundamental problem, which is the overcrowded classroom. Perhaps we should reduce the numbers of children in that class, build more classrooms, or get some to come on one day, others on a, another day, or take some to another school. Those are the solutions we should be looking at, not trying to mask the cough. The cough is, is just a symptom, it's not the problem. Okay, so I hope we get the analogy because that's what's happening with, in people with diabetes. A raise for sugar is just a symptom. It's not the problem. So when you focus on, I've got to bring down my blood sugar, I've got to bring down my blood sugar, you know, how do, let me, give me medicine, let me bring down my blood sugar. You're not actually addressing the underlying issue, okay? You're just treating the cough, not the overcrowded classroom. Blood sugar is just a symptom. It's just saying that something is not right with the way your system is working. So any treatment that is focused on just reducing your blood sugar does not give long-term solution, okay? So when we give you one medicine and your blood sugar is still not controlled and we put a second medicine, we're keeping an eye on the blood sugar. You're testing, oh, it's still high. So another medicine, oh, it's still high. So it's another medicine. We are not actually solving the problem. What we are doing with those medicine is to gather the blood sugar and stuff them away, hide, hide blood sugar somewhere. It's not solving the problem. It's like someone who has an overcrowded house and they buy yet another item, you know? The solution is not more items. It's not, it's not more shelves to put away the item. You know, the person gets another item, they, they, they hide it away in another shelf. The house is overcrowded. The solution is not more shelves. The solution is not more places to put the, the crowded stuff you're bringing in. So in diabetes, the solution is not to hide away the sugar. When you take your medicine, the sugar has been, you know, stuffed somewhere. Actually, it's all been converted to fat and stored away. So the underlying problem has not been solved. And that's why these meetings are really important so we can address that. 
I'm hoping that at the end of this four weeks, uh, you'll be so equipped. I want you to know that um, some of these ideas may be foreign to your doctors, your GPs, because they're not trained in lifestyle medicine, okay? You might go to them and say, oh, this is this, this, my Dr. Adeze said, and they're like, oh, mm. no, I don't think so, you know? <laughs> I want you to know that me as, you know, when I went through medical school, they didn't teach me this, you see? It's only recently that we've been taught that, look, this is actually the problem. We cannot focus on the blood sugar. The blood sugar is simply a symptom. We need to look at the root cause, okay? So you may find yourself educating your GP. You may say to the GP, this doctor has done lifestyle medicine. So that's what she's talking about because they may try to discourage you from some of the things we are talking about today. But we just want to help. We just want you to understand. That's why we're taking the time to go through the foundational steps. Once you get it, once you get it, honestly, you'll be amazed how quickly things can change for you. Okay, so... The key points from today, <clears throat> I'm not going to overload us since we have four weeks, but the key points is that, one, diabetes is increasing. The numbers have quadrupled, you know, who knows what's happening now? They keep increasing. So diabetes is increasing simply because obesity rates are increasing. Diabetes and obesity go together. You know, it's a, it's a, they go their hand in hand. If someone is obese, if they're, uh, if they're, um, uh, if their BMI is over 30, for example, or overweight when the BMI is over 25, it's just a matter of time. If things are not controlled, it's just a matter of time before they become diabetic. These two things go hand in hand, okay? So the other key point was that the commonest cause for limb amputation, for blindness, and a host of other issues is diabetes. So we need to tackle that. I have a personal experience why this is so dear to me. Why I'm so happy that when she contacted me and she said she wants to do this program, I was like, well done, this is great. We need more people coming out to do things like that. My own grandfather had diabetes, you see. He was diabetic. As far back as then, we didn't know much about diabetes, you know. So he, 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 he was so... Um, you know, he had complications from his diabetes and eventually he had to have his limb amputated. My grandfather had limb amputation. So this is a matter that is dear to me. He had his limb amputated because of his diabetes. And then one day he, he was sleeping, he went to bed and in the morning everybody woke up. Granddad didn't wake up and they thought he was just having a longer lie in bed, you know, only to find out that he was in a diabetic coma. He was in a diabetic coma. So that's how they eventually rushed him to hospital and after everything, he died. So diabetes is a matter that is dear to my heart, you know? And when, when Daibara contacted me, she said, oh, she's been struggling with diabetes. What should she do? And we, I said to her, come to my house. If you remember Daibara, I said, come to my house, bring pen and paper. We're going to talk through this, you know? Because in my heart, I was like, no, not another person. No more amputations. This has to, you know? I was just so fired up. And, and we talked through it and she, she, she got on board. She started researching, she doing her own research, working on, and it's amazing. When she now texts me and say, oh, my HVA one is 38. I'm like, yay, that's it, that's it. We're winning this battle. And I hope everyone here will take the message, take it out. It's especially important for us African, uh, African people. We seem to have more diabetes in our midst. You know, so we need to take the message out. I'm really delighted to see all the people who turned up. This is a free program. I don't know why people wouldn't come, you know, <laughs> for something so useful. So glad those of you that turned up, I hope this is really useful for you. So the other key point was that, was that it's a dietary problem and therefore solution must be dietary. It's not more medicines. It's not more medicines, okay? We've got to change the way we look at it change our paradigm and see what can we do differently with this problem. And the next key point is that raised blood sugar is a symptom, not a cause. You cannot be focused on, oh, I want to reduce my blood sugar, throwing medicines at it. No, we have to look at the root cause of the problem. So next week, I'll be talking a bit more on insulin produced by our own bodies. Insulin is our own, you know, we produce it. Uh, as a storage hormone 
We'll be looking at insulin resistance. We'll be looking at how to lower your insulin. Remember I said, if you have diabetes type two, you're, you have insulin resistance. So we need to find a way to lower the insulin. You already have too much insulin, okay? The key to reversing your diabetes is being able to lower your insulin, okay? And it's really important that once you're going off and doing things by yourself because you have to do things safely, you have to keep an eye on your blood sugar, make sure you are checking, okay? This is information. We're giving information. We're not saying go and stop your medicine. I will never say that. You understand? You have to work with your doctors. But what I would suggest is as we go through this program, you learn some things you want to implement. Check your blood sugar, jot down the numbers. Check your blood sugar, jot down the numbers. Then carry them and go to your doctor and say, these are the numbers I'm getting. Do you think you should adjust my medication? My diabetes seems to be getting better. Do you think we should, adjust? you know, you have to work with your own doctors, okay? Don't make any changes by yourself, really important. I need you to do things safely, okay? You have to work with your doctors, okay? Jot down your readings, pass on to them, say, what do you think? So that it will be their decision with yours to reduce your medication, okay? Now, we'll be talking next week about fasting. Fasting is one super way of reducing your, your insulin levels. But again, we need to talk through how to do that safely. Remember, I want you to keep safe. We'll talk about fasting. We'll talk about low carbohydrate meals. And I'm sure it will be super, super useful for you. So I'll stop so far in case there are one or two questions. I know it's, uh, the program is just about an hour long. We don't want to keep you, especially on a sunny, beautiful Aberdeen day like this. <laughs> so um, I have a YouTube channel called MEP. So MEP is mentally, emotionally, and physically fit person. It's on YouTube. I talk about weight loss and diabetes and so on. So feel free. It's a free resource. You can go on YouTube, set it up, and watch some of the clips. And I believe So thank you so much for listening. I'll hand over to Daibara. So I have a question. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Yeah, thank you very much, Doctor, for the very insightful session. It's such a wonderful thing to um, follow such um, beneficial uh, talks about diabetes and all the other related uh, things that come with it. So recently we are managing my um, dad who currently has a diabetic foot ulcer. Okay. So he's insisting that he wants to go home, but we feel that he would be better managed at the hospital. But then maybe because of the cost and all he's concerned, but we feel that he wouldn't be as well managed at the house than he would be at the hospital. So what is your opinion, like in managing the diabetic food ulcer, would it matter that the person is receiving treatment and taking his drugs at home than being at the hospital where he has the care of nurses and, you know, all the doctors there too? Okay, uh, thanks for that question. Um, diabetic foot ulcer is a chronic thing. It doesn't heal quickly. So there's, it's very unlikely that they can admit him to hospital for that, okay? Because that means he might be in hospital for months. Uh, yeah. So the hospital won't do that, okay? It, what he needs is to have it properly dressed. So sometimes we find that the nurses can come two or three times a week to the house to dress it. Or if your dad is able to move around, he can go, go to the nurses and uh, nurses clinic, you know, to have yeah. it dressed. It needs to be properly dressed. His blood sugar needs to be controlled because that's yeah. the underlying uh, problem. His diabetes has to improve for that ulcer to heal, yeah. you know? Yeah, so th those are two things I would say. The hospital can't admit him unless he's ill, you know, if he's having a raging fever, you know, there are other issues you know, that yeah. needs hospitalization. Otherwise, just diabetic foods, they can't because he, he's going to need treatment for months. Does that yeah. help? Yeah, it does. It does because it makes me wonder whether they, because he's not having any symptoms except that his sugar level was high when he was admitted and then he has the ulcer on his foot. Okay. 
So maybe the hospital keeping him could just be them having business. But I mean, if he could be taken home, I'm welcome to that too. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Right, have we got any other questions? Yeah, I can see a chat here. Okay, um, there's a question with uh, regards to dietary. I understand you need to reduce the amount of carb intake and food like food like white bread. How about stuff like whole wheat bread, such as hobbies mm -hmm. at reduced portion and oats meal or porridge as substitutes for ever? Okay, uh, so thank so you for that question. question. Mm. Yeah, so uh, the, the carbs that really need to be reduced um, are the refined carbs, okay? So the, the carbs that are refined, like the white bread you mentioned, your white rice and so on, those need to be reduced and if possible eliminated, actually. They're really, really bad for raising your insulin levels. You know, like I said, the person already has too much insulin. So these particular foods, refined foods, sugary food, they raise the insulin, making matters worse. So yes, you can look for substitutes. Just be mindful, um, read labels properly, you see? Because people are, people are now, the, the manufacturers are aware that people are becoming more knowledgeable about uh, the need to eat whole wheat bread and all that. So if you look, uh, I've seen some labels where it says whole wheat bread, the amount of the whole wheat was like 5%. The rest was still refined wheat. So it's like they put a sprinkle of whole wheat, you know, flour into it just so they can label it whole wheat, okay? But if you find purely whole wheat, and just to explain a bit, you know, wheat is a grain of, let's say, seed of the grass, the grass that we, that is edible. So when they get the, the wheat, it comes as a grain, okay? The grain has the inner part of it that is starch, that is purely starch but then it has the uh, outer bit of it that has some fiber and so on. So it's meant to be eaten as a whole grain, okay? But when it's refined, what they do is they remove that outer husk, that covering, and just leave the starchy bit. So you're actually eating pure starch and starch is concentrated sugar, you know? And that's why I said that white bread actually raises your blood sugar more than sugar itself. Can you imagine that? You know, your table sugar doesn't raise your blood sugar as much as white bread because white bread is concentrated sugar, you see. So if you can find alternatives, that's great. And we will talk about food in another session. So please stay tuned for your herb and so on. A lot of people are using oats. Again, the oat has to be, you know, make sure it's proper oats, not the instant oats. Instant oats is full of sugar, not healthy at all. But proper oats, is great because oat has lots of fiber and it's actually very good for diabetics. If you can try and have the oats without sugar, even better, you know. I, I, I have oats, uh, you know, if I do need to take oats, but I just use banana and I just slice in some banana pieces into it. I don't ever take my oats with sugar at all. I, I use milk, you know, milk and, and fruit, fruit bits to sweeten, no sugar at all. So I hope that's helpful for you. Ibarra has disappeared again. <laughs> Are you there, Daibara? Yeah, I'm sorry, my network went off again. Sorry about that. That's okay. All right. Okay. Um, I'm not getting any more questions here, so I think this will be a good time to wrap up, please. And uh, just before we go, um, can we please be reminded of uh, the next week event? So it continues, like Doc has said, the next, um, so we'll now have, you know, three to five weeks and it's gonna be 2 p.m. next week, same time, same place, you know, same time, same place. Looking forward to seeing every one of us and please spread the word that diabetes, there's a solution to it. It's not like a, a, de a dead end, you know, the solution to it, let's be hopeful, you know, you know, if it has, if it has if it has happened for one, you know, could replicate it and it could work for others as well. You know, Doc has said a lot about that. And like she said, I'm currently like on a normal range now, far from 
even pre-diabetic, you know? So, and um, that's, I give God praise for helping me to get to that level. And I know the same can happen to anyone that gets connected. And I got a question here now, a question here just came in and it says, uh, what is instant oat, please? Which, which is instant oat, sorry. Instant please, oat. Please so please the, the instant oats around. are those ones that, you just they are normally in sachets. You empty it and you you, you microwave it in thirty seconds or something like that. You know, um, they are often already packaged with uh, uh, sugar or sweeteners or whatever. Just as the name is, instant oats. It's made it's made for you to uh, be able to use it quickly. You know, unlike the normal oats where it takes a bit of time to uh, get cooked. <laughs> disappeared again. Right. Thanks so much for that explanation. So I hope that's clear now. Yeah, that's clear. Okay, she said thank you. That's fine. Okay, so we'll see the same place, same link next week, 2 p.m. And uh, please come with questions over the week. You may have questions, you may need to be addressed. So please come in with your questions. Write them down, get ready, because we are going to come ready for you as well. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks once again for coming in. God bless you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye. You're welcome. Thank You're welcome. you. Bye, Sister Faith. Thank you.